as possible for your presentation. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so I want to welcome everyone to uh, the presentation with uh, Dr. Amy Verial. Um, and um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce her and her bio. And then I'll turn it over uh, to her. And if you could, um, when we get to the question period, um, I, I think depending on the size of the participants, um, it might be easier just to go ahead and ask your question directly to her um, versus that uh, of writing in the chat. Um, if it, it becomes a larger group, uh, we'll go ahead and, and do it by chat, okay? Uh, so welcome everybody. My name is uh, Lloyd Lee. I'm the director for the Center for Regional Studies at the University of New Mexico. And I am been director for a little over uh, nine months now. So I'm still less than a year. And um, <clears throat> uh, today uh, we're having a presentation by uh, Dr. Amy Verial, who is an associate professor of Comparative Mexican-American Studies and directs the Center for Mexican-American Studies and Research at Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, she was trained as an anthropologist at the University of California at Santa Cruz, where she received her PhD in 2014. Uh, as a native uh, Nueva Mexicana who grew up in Santa Fe, uh, Dr. Villarreal prefers to call herself a home place ethnographer. Uh, she descends from farm workers, faith healers, educators, and community workers whose collective spirit she brings uh, to her teaching and activist scholarship. She's an interdisciplinary scholar who writes about sanctuary movements and other radical acts uh, of re rebeldia for social justice, equity, and sustainable futures in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. She was a Clements Fellow for the study of Southwestern America at Southern Methodist University uh, in 2017 and 18, and part of the first Latinx anthropology seminar at the School uh, for Advanced Research in 2019. She contributed as a researcher and producer for the award-winning animation Frontera, Revolt, and Rebellion on the Rio Grande in 2014. Her forthcoming book with the University of California, uh, University of Northern uh, Carolina, North Carolina Press, sorry, I'm not saying it correctly there, University of North Carolina Press, Sanctuary Escapes in the New Mexico Borderlands, tells time traveling stories about how vulnerable people band together in different times and places to create communities of protection and care under conditions of oppression. So I want to uh, have you welcome uh, Dr. Vidya and I'll turn it over to her. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee and to everyone at the Center for Regional Studies at UNM. I've had a wonderful time here and it's been very productive uh, working on my book, doing some new research. And I also like to thank uh, NewMexicoWomen.org and where I am, they allowed me to use their space today here in Santa Fe to give this presentation. So I'm very thankful to them for, for allowing me to be here and use their resources. So I guess I'll just go ahead and get started. I'm going to um, give a broad overview of my book project and also highlight the things that I learned during my time here with at UNM um, in the archives at the Southwest Research Center. Um, at Zimmer, Zimmer, Zimmerman Library. So these are the archives that I was working in, the Frank Sanchez papers and also the K. Cole papers. And so I'm gonna highlight a few things that I learned from my time here. Okay, so the title of my presentation is Sanctuary Escapes in the New Mexico Borderlands. And as you can see from this picture, this is um, taken from the work of Somos Un Pueblo Unido. And um, after the Trump administration um, started to kind of escalate anti-immigrant rhetoric and also policymaking and also anti 
asylum um, policies as well. And as you can see here, people were um, protesting this and also accentuating the fact that New Mexico has a long history, not only of migration, but also of radical hospitality, providing um, hospitality to communities that are refugees or immigrants or migrants. And so here's a little quote from um, city councilor Rene Villarreal, and I wanna highlight that Santa Fe is one of the oldest declared sanctuary cities in the nation. And we'll learn a little bit more about that in the presentation. And she says, New Mexico has a long tradition of providing sanctuary to those fleeing harm from the Pueblo revolt to those fleeing persecution in Central America during the 1980s. We won't turn our back on our traditions now. Instead, we must strengthen these policies. So yes, uh, Renee Villarreal is my sister, but I did not put uh, these words into her mouth. Um, she was part of um, one of the city councilors that reissued um, Santa Fe's welcoming city um, policy uh, after in, in 2016, after the Trump administration started to escalate anti-immigrant policies. So I started to think about this. Is sanctuary a New Mexico tradition? What would that mean? And if we were going to trace that back, we would need to reorient our whole understanding of what sanctuary's origins are. And so we often think of sanctuary in terms of biblical sources and uh, Western European laws, you know, co colonial or um, medieval laws and policies of people taking asylum in churches. Uh, so we often, you know, recall that history and almost every book that you get on sanctuary will have some line, a paragraph, maybe a whole chapter on this uh, Western European tradition. And so what my intent was, was to reorient uh, what sanctuary means in terms of indigenous um, practices of hospitality, humanitarianism and care. And also uh, what that means for um, a sanctuary concept that's rooted in the Americas as indigenous people became refugees in their own homeland, how that reshaped our idea of what safe haven means, of what sanctuary means. And so that's kind of my starting point for this project. Oh, I'll stay there for a minute. So really what I'm trying to do is that my work traces different mobilizations of sanctuary in distinct periods of social and political crisis in what I have termed the New Mexico borderlands. And that's a geographic focus on what's called the tri-state region, which is New Mexico, Ciudad Juarez, El Paso borderland area. And my intention was to kind of bring New Mexico out of rooted regionalism and bring it into borderlands concepts and borderlands scholarship because New Mexico is often ignored as an important site for migration and the study of progressive immigration policies, which it has been um, for a long time. And so that's kind of making this more known and most of the books on sanctuary, they're wonderful, um, but they focus on the Bay Area, Arizona and the RGV area, the Rio Grande Valley area of Texas. And there hasn't been much written about New Mexico as an important place to research sanctuary movements and immigrant rights activism. And so I'm trying to bring light to uh, what we have done here in New Mexico. So I introduced the concept of sanctuary scapes to illuminate the broad diversity of activities that can fall under the sanctuary canopy from indigenous regions of refuge, and church asylum during the Spanish colonial period to the 1980s faith-based sanctuary movements that inspired the, the establishment of sanctuary cities and states and other policies to immigrant-led social and religious movements today. And I also wanted to bring attention to the kind of sanctuary scapes or sanctuary spaces that migrants create for themselves. Uh, often in churches, and in my case, it was in um, charismatic prayer group networks that were transnationally formed, mostly with people from Guatemoc, Chihuahua, who had settled in Santa Fe. And so the kinds of spaces that migrants create for themselves to try to create a home in a new place. 
and to create networks of protection and care. So um, I also did a lot of work with Somos Un Pueblo Unido. I started working with them in 2010. Um, as a policy consultant and also a researcher and activist. And I worked with them for about five years on their local immigration policy activism and documented that. And so um, at the same time I was working with Somos Un Pueblo Unido, I was documenting the rise of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, uh, which arrived with immigrants from Cuauhtémoc, Chihuahua, uh, mostly women who are very talented lay preachers and musicians uh, who started this very vibrant religious movement um, at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in Santa Fe. So all of these threads kind of uh, were rotating together as I was doing my research and really trying to, at the same time that I was doing this, I was also making the documentary about the Pueblo Revolt. And from the archaeologists, I was able to learn about Pueblo cities of refuge and other um, sanctuary scapes that indigenous people created uh, to survive and thrive under colonialism. So as these threads were kind of mixing and um, intertwining, uh, the idea of the book came about and the idea of sanctuary scapes came about through real grounded ethnographic research with communities here in New Mexico. So I focus on um, kind of four aspects of sanctuary. There are different ways that we can define sanctuary and many different ways that it's getting mobilized today. Uh, but I focus on indigenous regions of refuge during the Spanish colonial period to reshape our origin story of where sanctuary comes from. I also focus on the sanctuary movement of the 1980s in New Mexico in the tri-state region. Um, and this I see as kind of a touchstone period where sanctuary really starts to develop alongside militarization of the border and other strategies of immigrant detention and deportation that really have intensified since the 1980s. And it's interesting to me how they correspond with sanctuary movements and um, sanctuary cities and everything sanctuary, right? So, um, as we've seen, there are many different, um, I guess, iterations of sanctuary and also its reversals. So um, sanctuary movements and practices continue to be vital in light of ongoing um, global refugee crises, including current waves of Central American migration, um, the intensification of bans, border barriers, immigration raids, inhumane treatment of asylum seekers, which intensified during the Trump administration's zero policy or zero tolerance policy, which ended up um, separating children from their families, um, and the stay in Mexico policy, which um, detained or deterred uh, migrants from entering the United States. However, um, the persecution or prosecution, I should say, of populations marked as expendable, unwanted or removable runs very deep in the history of the nation. It's rooted in the origins of settler states and its legacies of genocide and removal of indigenous populations, the transatlantic slave trade and other forms of human caging and unfreedom throughout the history of the nation. And this reality forces us to confront sanctuary's underbelly as a temporary fix for settler state conscious assaults on targeted communities, which are longstanding. Um, sanctuary holds out radical potential as a social movement, as a practice of humanitarianism, but it always has an outside, and that outside makes sanctuary necessary. The conditions that permanent stakes. It's that external threat which causes people to flee and seek safety among friends or strangers. Sanctuary is often defined in terms of space, but it's also temporal. So it has a temporality, a time period. Um, it's like an interval. It um, has this temporal quality that's actually tied to settler logics and relations. Um, it's an interval between cycles of violence or dispersals of relations to people, land, place, and also material and immaterial. We also have to remember the spiritual aspect of sanctuary, um, immaterial presences. 
So it is often precarious and temporary, an interval between safety and violence. It's a meanwhile practice. Um, in this sense, sanctuary is kind of living in the interval um, between these cycles of violence. But sanctuary also escapes all kinds of enclosures. It escapes the church and the mission. It escapes the church grounds. It escapes the city and the state. It also escapes our, our um, efforts to control it, to make it permanent. Um, so that's why I introduced sanctuary escapes, right? Because it escapes enclosures of all kinds. And in this sense, drawing on Chicana feminist theory and also Native American studies, it's like a third space, a borderland writ large, um, a sanctuary scape. And in my view, and for my purposes, right, uh, if we boil it down to its most fundamental or simplistic definition, sanctuary is the search for a home and the making of home places on occupied and unsettled native land. The only solution to the problem of sanctuary is decolonization and abolition. And that's going to take lots of time. And also those ideas are also contested. And so we are going to be living in the interval for a long time. And that's what makes sanctuary not only relevant to immigrants or refugees, but to all of us who have made a home or a home place on occupied and unsettled native lands. So as you can see, sanctuary can also be reversed. And these are some images here of, you know, during the Trump administration, um, there was an attack, right, on sanctuary cities or jurisdictions and um, cities like even states like Texas banned the um, implementation or the establishment of sanctuary jurisdictions. And um, other cities reasserted them, like Santa Fe, Albuquerque, and other cities in, in New Mexico and elsewhere. Um, Operation Safe City, as you can see, was a targeted attack and, um, of immigration raids on declared sanctuary jurisdictions under the Trump administration. So you see how sanctuary gets remobilized in its reverse. The safe city becomes the shadow city, the places where um, undocumented people have to hide. Uh, so we've also seen in recent, um, just in the couple you know, months, how sanctuary has been mobilized for conservative movements. So Lubbock recently declared itself a sanctuary for the unborn. And of course, these mobilizations were against um, you know, um, policies, uh, constitutional policies and, and federal policies that allow for abortion. And we also see here in New Mexico even, um, counties and localities declaring themselves sanctuary or second amendment sanctuaries um, for um, to you know, have the ability to carry guns uh, without any restrictions. And so interestingly, I just found out yesterday that New Me most of the counties in New Mexico have declared some kind of policy in that sense, except for Santa Fe, Taos, San Miguel County and uh, Bernalillo County. All the other counties have either implemented or considered a, a Second Amendment sanctuary policy. So we see how sanctuary can get mobilized in all kinds of directions, escaping our attempts to nail it down. So just thinking about these origin stories of sanctuary um, and the call to decolonize the idea of sanctuary, um, sanctuary scape is, is a call to decolonize the concept by redefining it as a dynamic cultural tradition and indigenous survival strategy cultivated in regions in ref of, of refuge and rebellion in the Americas. And so this means that we kind of separate or we can not necessarily separate, but we um, kind of refocus our attention away from biblical origins and um, the historical trajectories of Western European notions of criminal justice and look at um, native practices of humanitarianism. So my intent here in looking at regions of refuge and rebellion during the Spanish colonial period is to also to look at, as you can see on this side, the map, um, kind of this area, which I'm defining as 
the New Mexico borderlands. And these are long relations that New Mexico has had with Northern Mexico. And to think about that as not necessarily a definable cultural region, but something that we can kind of map out ethnographically and historically as having a relation with Northern Mexico. And usually the borderlands, you know, kind of cut off our research agendas too, right? And we end up thinking of New Mexico as a bounded place um, when we should think of it as a more dynamic or expansive um, region. So my intention is to reclaim sanctuary as an indigenous survival strategy, to center the coloniality of sanctuary as part of the forced congregation and conversion of indigenous people and their resistance to that, and redefine sanctuary to capture the broad diversity of forms, right, that collective acts of material and spiritual restoration can take. So um, Pueblo cities of sanctuary. So I, as I was researching um, for the film, I encountered a number of archaeologists, some of them native archaeologists, like um, Dr. Aguilar, Joseph Aguilar from San Ildefonso Pueblo, uh, who taught me about Pueblo regions of refuge or sanctuary cities that emerged after the Pueblo revolt. And so archaeologists have, a, uh, you know, in their collaborations with native people in these areas, have identified um, at least five or six of these cities of sanctuary. And I have them kind of circled out on the map and they're not exact locations, but I did my best. So Do Doa Yalani at Zuni, when people congregated on Corn Mountain following the Pueblo Revolt and Tuño um, or Black Mountain at San Ildefonso, Coyititi at Cochiti Pueblo, and then three at Temes Pueblo. And what was interesting about these places is that we see social reorganization we also see um, indigenous people moving to ancestral sites that were important to them spiritually and um, culturally before the Spanish arrived and rebuilding communities on these sites. What was interesting about the cities in the Hemis area is that we see for the first time different Pueblo groups living together and also along with some Athabascan people. And so they had to come up with strategies to get along. And so some of them at Potakwa, for example, created a dual Kiva system of winter and summer people to share power among um, people who are speaking different languages. So um, we have, uh, and also from different Pueblos congregating in one site. We also see a, a, a rise of semiotics or revolutionary symbols uh, based on pottery and um, and we see the different trade routes that are going on between these sanctuary locations or sanctuary cities. And um, so we see a lot of innovations, cultural innovations as Pueblo people were nation building following the Pueblo revolt. So there were also Apache uh, controlled regions of refuge, um, one called um, El Cuartalejo. And during the Spanish colonial period before and after the revolt, um, Pueblo people, especially the frontier Pueblos routinely escaped to El Cuartalejo and um, into these autonomous regions. And so interestingly, if you were going to take sanctuary in the mission, you had to submit to baptism. And that meant that you had to enter the mission in order to receive protection and care. And if you left, you became an apostate, which is actually a criminal. And that was a crime against God and the colonial state. And so, um, but you know, the, the El Cuartalejo wasn't so far away. <laughs> People routinely escaped there. And so we see this kind of dynamic system of sanctuary scapes as Pueblo and Athabascan people um, were negotiating colonial rule. So the Spanish system of church asylum, uh, which was active actually in Mexico all the way up until um, 1860s, uh, which is a long period of time in Latin America or in the Americas, we see that the Spanish system of asylum was very structured. Um, it was based on both civic civil and spiritual documents. 
if you took sanctuary in a church or mission, they were the authorities could not take you out without a special bond, which was signed by one of the um, priests. So there was a very kind of, um, uh, I guess we could say, conflictual relationship between um, the church and the state, right, in New Mexico. And sanctuary was at the center of that. So sometimes people took advantage of sanctuary. There's a case that I found of a mestizo who uh, went from sanctuary to sanctuary escaping capture. And he was accused of rallying up the um, converted Pueblos and uh, just creating chaos. But I never was able to find what happened to him. So church sanctuary worked out pretty well for him. There's also some cases of um, Pueblo people using um, Iglesia Me Llamo, which is a, a kind of like, I am going to remain silent. So you could actually go into the mission and refuse to talk to anyone by saying, me, Iglesia Me Llamo, church is my name, over and over again, and not answer any of their questions. So there are uh, incidences of Pueblo people using that, Iglesia Me Llamo, and avoiding and um, capture or imprisonment um, for up to for years at a time. But what we see here is that sanctuary is another enclosure within colonial space, colonized spaces. And so if you weren't going to be in the prison, you were imprisoned in the church. And who knows what the priests were going to make you do <laughs> while you were in the church, um, probably work for them or, you know, whatever it was. So people of all classes and races, there's documents that I found in the colonial record, took sanctuary in churches. So as you can see, San Jeronimo mission here in Taos, um, this is the ruins of sanctuary in New Mexico. And um, the last incidence of, of we can see of like the traditional sanctuary of church sanctuary that developed under Spanish colonialism, um, it ends in with the Taos revolt, the Taos rebellion in 1847, when uh, the people from Taos Pueblo took sanctuary at San Jeronimo when the US government tried to put down the rebellion at Taos. So remember um, a, a group of Mexican nationalists, both Hispano and um, native killed Governor Bent and started a revolution. Uh, the US government brought down a campaign of blood on fire in, on Taos Pueblo. Um, the rebels, some of them escaped to the Apache controlled regions, right to the Jicaria. And about 200 people took sanctuary at San Jeronimo and the US government burned the church to the ground and everybody inside. And so that's the end, I would say, of co the colonial period sanctuary church asylum. And then, like I said, I'm building a new origin story and this is not chronological necessarily. There's snapshots of when sanctuary becomes vibrant or relevant during uh, particular moments of social and political crisis. So we're gonna jump through the, the sanctuary scape all the way to the 1980s, <laughs> okay? So I'm you know, giving you an origin story and now we're moving on to um, the contemporary period. And most of my book is focuses on the contemporary period. So um, sanctuary becomes vibrant again and gets revitalized in the late 1970s and throughout the 80s in response to the Central American refugee crisis. And we're seeing the, effort, the uh, echo effects of um, those policies and wars that were happening in Central America right now as those failed states produce more people seeking refuge, yes? So um, as we know, um, the, this was a very interesting period, especially for um, immigration policy making and um, also for the idea of sanctuary. So by 1987, over 20% of El Salvador's population had become refugees. Over 70,000 civilians were killed or just disappeared. And only 3% actually were granted asylum in the US. And because people were not able to get asylum and Reagan's policies in Central America were exacerbating the situation by funding the Contras. And so, especially in Guatemala, indigenous people were hit particularly hard um, 
the Mayan people um, during this period. And many of them walked like in caravans that we saw recently um, to uh, the border um, asking for sanctuary. And because the US government was not allowing them to get, or get asylum in most cases, uh, churches stepped in and started giving people sanctuary. And we saw hundreds of churches throughout the United States um, contesting uh, Reagan's policies in Central America and also um, forming, organizing um, to change these policies and also protecting um, people from Central America from deportation. All right, so at the same time that the sanctuary movement starts to gain momentum in New Mexico and elsewhere, we also see the rise of privatized immigration detention centers and militarized borders and also special border ops called Bortec um, that were specially designed to put down rebellions or riots or protests in detention centers, incidentally. We see Bortec again in Portland. Um, they were mobilized by the Trump administration um, to arrest and, um, protesters that were part of the Black Lives Matters movements. So I'm sure you have heard of Bortec before. This is the picture here. So in 1983, the city council in Roswell decides to um, unanimously approve the repurposing of the International Air Base, which was the same place that the UFOs supposedly landed, <laughs> okay, as one of the first privatized immigration detention centers. And so this was new on the scene. And um, the city council in Roswell was all for it. They thought it was going to bring jobs to the area. They argued that it would especially bring jobs for Hispanics uh, who could, were bilingual. And um, these were some of the arguments made for it as an economic um, venture. And um, so the Senate, you know, the senators at the time had to consider, you know, whether they're going to have this privatized detention center. It was, um, I get the the, um, I guess, organization that was putting this forth was called P Pomona um, Behavioral Systems, and it was located in California. And so um, the co congressional delegation at first was all for it and we're gonna pass it. And the um, local people in Roswell, Frank Sanchez among them, and other minority groups organizing under minorities of, of, um, of Roswell, organized with um, an interfaith community, including the um, Diocese of Las Cruces, Catholic churches in Roswell, and also some Protestant churches, and the Council of Churches here in New Mexico um, organized against it and were able to block it from ever happening. So that's very interesting that they were able to block it. And, but at the same time, Roswell was noticing a swell in their immigrant population. And they held a meeting about this and over 300 immigrants showed up, which is very interesting to me because we often don't think of Roswell. We think of it as little Texas, and we don't think of it as a place where of, of Mexican settlement, Mexican immigrant settlement. But it was and, and has been ever since we've got dairies, right, and agriculture and chili farming in the southeast. So, of course, um, these laborers were starting to settle and have always settled in these regions. And um, so Roswell was very much focused on providing services for immigrants and also helping them to gain, um, to adjust their status and to get citizenship. And so that was their project in the Southeast. They were very concerned uh, about immigrants and the exploitation of immigrants and discrimination against Hispanics in the Southeast. Whereas people in the North and also um, in the El Paso region were focused on refugees and um, the sanctuary movement. Now these movements I realized in my research overlapped. 
because Frank Sanchez is the spokesperson who gets sent to meetings here in Albuquerque of the Sanctuary Task Force. So we see that they're collaborating, they know what he, what's going on in each other's regions, and we see kind of the immigrant rights also kind of overlapping actually with the sanctuary work. So 1986, actually 1985, we'll roll it back a little, a little bit, the city of Santa Fe declares itself a sanctuary for Central American refugees. And um, that was one of the first sanctuary cities in the nation. And Tony and Naya in 1986 declares this whole state of New Mexico a sanctuary for Central American refugees, uh, which is uh, very interesting because it was one of the first sanctuary states right, ever declared. And he wasn't doing this really on his own accord. Uh, he was a sympathizer of the Central American cause and also the sanctuary movement. And the Council of Churches and faith groups throughout New Mexico um, mobilized and also petitioned and supported this. So he wasn't doing this as kind of a rogue thing, right? Although a lot of people interpreted it that way to deny the fact that there was a large movement in the tri-state region and that New Mexico was part of the Underground Railroad that was helping Central Americans get to their hubs, different hubs in Los Angeles, Florida, even Canada. And there were individuals doing this work and um, sanctuary houses or uh, safe houses throughout Albuquerque. Um, the, the churches that were doing this work were in direct opposition to the rise of the evangelical right. So we see here in New Mexico, a very strong presence of the liberal Christian left, which is the Friends Meeting, the Mennonites, uh, mainline Protestants, and also Catholics. Um, so most of the people that were doing sanctuary work were women and people of faith. So in the archive, I saw this over the summer, I see a lot of women from Albuquerque in the South Valley who are actually giving direct services to um, refugees. They were opening their homes. They were providing all kinds of assistance on their own dime and also asking for help from churches and from other organizations. So it's really, you know, these women who are providing protection and care yes, to refugees in Albuquerque and elsewhere. And as you can see, the sanctuary state was a controversial thing. Tony Anaya, and this was a time when governors did not get airtime on national television, actually was interviewed by Tom Brokaw about the sanctuary state declaration. And here we have a cartoon by John Traver, and it shows him kind of like a grandstanding. Um, I find myself identifying with political refugees. So um, this cartoonist was showing kind of the political nature of the sanctuary declarations but also denying the fact that there was a strong sanctuary movement. So New Mexico was also the center of a sanctuary trial. Now there were people who were, the, the, FBI, the FBI of course infiltrated these movements and New Mexico, um, people in New Mexico were you know, involved in transporting Central Americans across the border uh, without authorization. And so they, some of them were engaged in work that would be considered illegal or against the law, but to them, they believed that justice was above the law and they were doing this um, based on their conviction uh, and their faith that, um, the, that US immigration policies was morally wrong. And so they believed that it was their calling to do this work, a religious calling. And that's why I don't want us to lose track of the spiritual nature of sanctuary. It often gets defiled as it enters these policy worlds and as um, city declarations and revolution or um, resolutions when we try to pin sanctuary down and make it permanent, right? Um, the transcendent nature of it um, comes through in the faith-based practices and um, people risking their lives and livelihood to help migrants um, find a safe haven. So in um, the late 80s, 1986, um, just 
close after 1988, I believe, right after uh, Tony and I had declared the state of New Mexico a sanctuary for Central American refugees, sanctuary activists really took that to heart. And Demetria Martinez was a journalist at the time. She's a famous New Mexican author. Um, some of you might have read her work. She um, was documenting the sanctuary movement. And Glenn Thamert, who is pictured here, uh, was a Lutheran minister who was working in Central America with the Lutherans and also helping Central Americans um, come to the US. Uh, he had helped two Salvadoran women who were pregnant arrange legal adoptions in Albuquerque and to find and to come to Albuquerque to stay in safe houses until their babies were born. Demetria had gone to document this sanctuary incident and both of them were indicted um, for transporting Central Americans illegally. And they were facing about 25 years in prison. What was interesting about the sanctuary trial in New Mexico is in, in all other instances where people were um, charged or indicted for transport, for human trafficking, basically, um, they were convicted. In New Mexico, that wasn't the case. So Demetria was able to argue that she was practicing her um, First Amendment rights as a journalist to document a sanctuary incident. And her case was rather clear. Now, um, Glenn Thamert, of course, was using a religious argument that he was called as a Lutheran minister to shelter the stranger, to help the stranger, and to help these women um, who were in need of attention and care. But that argument wasn't working in any of the other sanctuary trials. And so he um, was able to actually use Tony Anaya's sanctuary city or sanctuary state declaration, which was never meant to be legal. It was actually just a statement of solidarity with the Central American cause as a platform to, um, for his acquittal. Because the judge finally decided that, well, Tony Anaya was the highest authority of the state at the time. And if he declared New Mexico a state for sanctuary, why wouldn't we believe him? And so um, Glenn Thamer was actually acquitted on his belief in the sanctuary state and not necessarily on his religious conviction. So as we see here, um, all of these things are happening at the same time. Um, Central Americans are seeking uh, refuge in churches and also applying for asylum in the United States. Um, Faith-based communities are organizing to help them and shelter them. Um, new militarized you know, border policies and immigration detention centers were on the rise. And in the center of this, we see um, a Native American man of Obijewe's descent who um, was from Minnesota. And he was a founder of AIM, and he is on the run, a fugitive from the law and taking sanctuary. And so his case is actually very interesting because as a Native American, he is a man without a country at this period. Um, just as you know, people are focused a lot on refugees from other areas, we see that AIM, what a person that was involved in activism is also on the run. So he's accused of conspiracy to riot and destruction of property related to an incident that happened at Wounded Knee in Custer, South Dakota. And those of you who are familiar with um, the American Indian movement will know about this incident, yes? So in 1975, Banks was subpoenaed to appear in Custer, South, there, South Dakota on 11 charges. He refuses to show and flees with his family to California. And so he petitions um, Governor Jerry Brown for sanctuary um, when he's arrested in California in 1976. And the governor of South Dakota, Governor Jank Lau, um, asks to extradite him back to South Dakota to serve um, a grand jury to stand before a grand jury. And so um, he's an organizer, he's an activist. He, um, he and his family are able to galvanize a broad movement to petition the governor to um, allow him to stay in California. And Jerry Brown decides to do just that and gives um, Dennis Bank sanctuary in California. So his argument, Dennis Bank's argument was that he was not gonna be safe if he returned to South, South Dakota. There were too many people who wanted to kill him 
including the governor himself. Um, he says that the governor was quoted saying, the only way to deal with the American Indian movement is to put a bullet in their head and they won't bother you anymore. So Banks had a long history with Janklau. Janklau actually was tried on the reservation, on the Rosebud Reservation for raping a 15 year old girl. He was also, um, Janice Banks was the lawyer in that case and Janklar was convicted on, in the tribal court. So um, his, the Banks argument was that Janklar had a vendetta against him and he was never gonna be safe in South Dakota. So that was uh, um, the reason why he was able to get sanctuary in California. But as I've said, sanctuary is temporary, right? So once the Republican governor was elected, and Jerry Brown was no longer in office, what do you think happened to the sanctuary? <laughs> um, you know, his sanctuary in California, well, it disappears and he has to flee again with his family. So um, in 1982, he flees again, this time drawing on his native resources. He takes sanctuary at the Anagada Nation in New York State and um, He's granted sanctuary among the Six Nations Territory, which is actually a transnational Haudenosaunee tribes or the Iroquois nation. And I think this was intentional. He was an activist, so I think this was symbolic. He um, intentionally chose this place because it was a transnational indigenous nation and because it was of course, the, this nation is credited for inspiring the US Constitution. So it was very strategic on his um, you know, to his case, but also the Haudenosaunee tribes, um, they have a tradition of offering sanctuary and um, it's called the Great Love Peace. And he was granted sanctuary in the Longhouse with ceremony under the Tree of Peace on their reservation. And Governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo Sr. at the time, um, said that he could have sanctuary in New York State as long as he stayed on the reservation which of course became very difficult for him and his family as all of these people, journalists and others rushed into um, the reservation to try to interview him and disrupted uh, the community there. Uh, so he finally decides to turn himself in. And Dennis Banks served um, three years in prison um, based on these trumped up charges of what happened at Wounded Knee. So what I'm trying to put together here is that the, the types of policies, practices, ideologies that have um, defined how we treat immigrants and refugees are related to how we treated and how the US has treated indigenous people um, under settler colonialism. And they're tied together. Also, as the US you know, develops these privatized detention and deportation systems, um, and um, militarizes borders and creates new um, policing techniques, uh, they also filter down and end up impacting citizens. So we're, this is all tied together. And that's why I think when they say the border is everywhere, it is, <laughs> and sanctuary is everywhere, as we have seen as well as sanctuary has proliferated. Um, now we talk about sanctuary campuses. UNM has considered that. We talk about sanctuary workplaces where immigrant employees are protected from, you know, get raids and other stuff. We see um, the new sanctuary movement in churches. People continue to take um, sanctuary in churches today to uh, avoid deportation. So um, sanctuary is alive and well, and it is activism. And as we can see here, um, this is, these are photographs of the driver's license battle in New Mexico and um, immigrants who are involved with Somos un Pueblo Unido also saw this as a spiritual, a spiritual warfare. Um, as you can see here, the, um, the little uh, Santo Nino is present <laughs> in these pictures. And so the correspondence between um, faith and activism also continues in immigrant rights activism today. And so that's my presentation. And I really thank you for your attention. I know it was a lot and we went through all kinds of cases and histories and historical periods. And so I'll stop here and um, open for questions.
Yeah, if you could just go ahead and um, ask your question directly uh, to her, that would be fine. We're, we're pretty small, so. Go ahead, Dr. Rivera, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, let me kind of get back to my screen here. Y yes, uh, Amy, uh, you noted in your in your uh, background that you come from a farm worker family, I believe, or yeah, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what about Cesar Chavez and the farm worker movement, you know, in California and then spread out all over the place, you know, were, were there elements of, of sanctuary, uh, you know, during, during that period mm -hmm. of uh, farm worker activism, organ organizing, uh, mm -hmm. spreading the word, you know, boycotts, pickets, et cetera? Yes, if I would, um, if we think about sanctuary scapes, right, writ large um, and, and a more dynamic term, um, the, the farm workers movement was a faith-based movement in many regards, um, especially when you're, uh, Cesar Chavez himself was an extremely faithful man. And the march, you know, um, to Delaney, from Delaney to Sacramento was a pilgrimage. Uh, they were marching under the banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe. They were praying in churches and communities along the way. And this is strategic, you know, to, to humanize immigrants, right? And to see them as, as, as moral, ethical, religious people, uh, which was, of course, helps the movement. But that's not to deny the fact that these were very spiritual people um, and that Cesar Chavez himself, you know, part of his activism was going on fasts and praying and um, doing a lot of work in churches. And so I think that, yes, absolutely. We could say that the farm workers movement had elements of sanctuary and sanctuary scapes. Oh, and my farm worker background is through my father's side. <laughs> my father is from South Texas and um, he grew up as a migrant laborer. Um, with his family. And um, actually they're visiting um, New Mexico right now. And so I get to see them. <laughs> and I went to, to South Texas often as a child. So I feel like I have farm worker roots. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Um, Amy, can you hear me? This is Rebecca. Yes. Yeah. Hey, so um, I want to thank you for an amazing presentation. Um, there's so much that you covered today, and I'm really excited to see the book and, and all the work that that you um, publish. Um, I have a, a question just to and I don't know if this is something that you can elaborate on. But in the section where you were talking about um, Pueblo cities of refuge and sanctuary after the Pueblo revolt. You mentioned just in passing, and I just was interested in the revolutionary symbols based on pottery. Um, I know this this might sound like, a, you know, I mean, you just mentioned it, but I was really interested in um, uh, you raising this. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how these symbols um, that were based on pottery, how they were used within this particular context, if, that, if that's something that you have um, been able to research. Yes, actually, um, there's a wonderful article by Sarah Pearsall on um, radical conservatism in the Pueblo Revolt. And, she, and actually, she's drawing on work that archaeologists have done. And it's in a book by um, Purcell called Archaeologies of the Pueblo Revolt. And one of the a few of the articles in that book talk about the semiotics of revolution. And um, so they looked at different ceramics and pottery shards um, from that period or the post-revolt period. And they see kind of a standardization of some of the older um, symbols of feathers and other symbols. Um, that were kind of able to cross different Pueblo communities that, that were intelligible across native communities. And they were being used on pottery as kind of a revolutionary symbol is what they're, you know, they're, they're talking about because they see them showing up at all of these different sites of uh, Pueblo cities of sanctuary. And so we see that there's trading going on between these sites. 
Um, we might, uh, one of the authors kind of thinks of it as, you know, women carrying these pots with the revolutionary symbol <laughs> and going to get water and showing, you know, that they're part of this broader community. And um, the archaeologists see this as nation building among um, Pueblo people post-revolt. And it would be, you know, fascinating, you know, to see uh, more research on the post-revolt period, which is gaining momentum right now. So I think um, there's a lot to learn uh, still about these um, Pueblo cities of refuge. But what it tells me, and also, you know, when I was working with Somos un Pueblo Nido, it was, it was very inspiring to think that, you know, Pueblo cities of refuge are part of our heritage of sanctuary here in New Mexico, and that can still be a, a source of inspiration for our movements today. And um, even when we went to give our testimony, right, in the city council, to the city council in Santa Fe and elsewhere, people started saying that, as my sister did and others, that sanctuary is a, a long tradition in New Mexico. And we owe that, of course, to our Pueblo and Athabascan relatives. So I think that um, you know it's it's just important to see that as a, an important origin story um, that we can believe in um, as Nuevo Mexicanos um, to think about sanctuary movements today. Absolutely, thank you so much, Amy. This was this was wonderful. Thank you for your question. I met, uh, this is Ruth. I have a question. Um, I, I was thinking about the comment that you made about how Novel Mexico gets left out of the conversation of um, immigration, activism. Um, I'm not so sure about policies, but um, I think that's very interesting. And I, I kind of see um, something similar with San Antonio, Texas, where I'm at and where you are at. And I'm wondering if it's this, if it's the colonial um, mindset or colonial influence um, that both places have that either, um, it, it, I'm not too sure how to, how to, you know, describe it, but if, if that mindset keeps people from uh, participating in activism or not wanting to see the issues and, and get involved or, um, I'm not too sure, you know, you, you would know, but yeah. what do you think about that? I think uh, San Antonio and, you know, New, and New Mexico are very different political animals. So the context is, is different, but we do have a shared Spanish colonial um, history, especially yeah. around the missions um, and the relationship to indigenous people. And also how tourism has influenced um, the economies and also how we think of ourselves in these places. <laughs> um, so tourism has a, a deep impact, um, both the place I grew up in Santa Fe and the place where we live now in San Antonio. And so I think there is um, some kind of element there, but I think in Texas, there are movements, there are, you know, some of the strongest movements of helping refugees are, are in the RGV. And um, also in San Antonio, there's you know, immigrant rights movements as well. But I think that it's very difficult to get anywhere because of our political situation. Um, and so I think um, people get disheartened and um, step away from the movement. Mm -hmm. um, as far as New Mexico, I think that scholarship on New Mexico has often positioned us within rooted regionalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, we often think of and there's nothing wrong with it, Cadencia. And I remember when I went through my graduate program at Boulder, I was um, critiqued by my committee because I was giving this more expansive borderlands notion of my research and location, and they wanted the Pueblo Southwest. <laughs> so um, we see that, you know, it's shaped how we think of ourselves in terms of continuity and in terms of, um, you know, a place-based understanding of who we are, which is important. Mm -hmm. Dwelling is important. Um, and we're not gonna, you know, necessarily throw that out. Uh, that's definitely part of the story, but we also have to see ourselves as part of a broader um, landscape and set of relationships that moves across borders, um, moves across the boundaries of New Mexico. 
And yes, we are a unique population, no doubt, and with a unique history, but we also um, need to think of ourselves more broadly as a um, site of, an, of migration and interaction in that way. I think in terms of scholarship, New Mexico is often kind of put aside because it's not um, a place where migrants go in great numbers. <laughs> so not like Los Angeles, right? Or not like um, the Valley of South Texas or San Antonio. It's, we don't have huge populations, right? Of immigrants coming to settle here because we are a poor state. And I remember one of my advisors told me, why do you wanna study immigration in New Mexico? That's a backwater. <laughs> and I was offended, <laughs> but um, I think that um, we are a border state. And of course we have um, been impacted by um, immigration policies. And we, we are a center for the making of very progressive sanctuary policies and immigration policies. So I think um, New Mexico needs to be recognized in that regard and also to see ourselves in that way too. Uh, so it, I think there's kind of a dynamic relationship of how we see ourselves, our own identities, and also um, thinking of our, our identities more broadly and our scholarship um, in terms of borderlands concepts. Thank you. Answer. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was a hand up, uh, Dr. Garcia, did you want to oh. try and ask your question? Uh, yeah, Dr. Villarreal, has, what a great uh, presentation as always. And uh, it's, such a, we're, it's such a blessing to have you here in New Mexico and, 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 and sharing these, 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 these great stories about sanctuary. Um, I had a, a question while I was you know, um, listening to, um, uh, thinking about, I really like the way that, uh, that it doesn't have to be a linear model to, to talk about sanctuary, that we can think about scapes and uh, cult, uh, ethnoscapes or uh, you know, uh, scapes of, of sanctuary in, in many different ways that are um, uh, nonlinear. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about in, in terms of that is how in many ways uh, is, is thinking about medical sanctuary or even, you know, the idea of this, like the sanitariums uh, during the 1880s, uh, thinking about the counterculture of the 1960s, uh, how can we think about these sorts of things within uh, these, these new ways of thinking about uh, sanctuary scapes. I think that's really, it's a really powerful uh, concept that's, that's gonna be coming out of your book. And it's a, uh, uh, thanks. Young, so. That's a great question, um, Dr. Garcia. And I think that it shows a gap in my vision <laughs> because I have um, not looked at Anglo sanctuaries, right? And how um, people from all over took sanctuary or formed sanctuaries here in New Mexico, um, either for health reasons uh, like tuberculosis, as you mentioned, or also just, you know, not fitting into Victorian society and coming to the desert to escape persecution. A lot of uh, queer people came out to New Mexico, artists, women who didn't want to get married, who wanted to write and be artists. Uh, so people who were trying to escape the confines of their social situation and finding community here of protection and care. So what I learned about La Fonda Hotel recently um, was that it was a place where rich people from you know, the coasts would send their wayward children. So people who they thought you know, would never fit into their, their, their uh, family, um, people with um, mental health issues, people just who were just defined as you know, outsiders. And so La Fonda was a sanctuary for those people. Uh, so I think that you're absolutely right that there are all kinds of sanctuaries. And my focus is on, um, of course, indigenous people and um, on um, immigrants from Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America, Central America, but we can find uh, sanctuary anywhere. And there's a wonderful, um, 
collection of radical, it was a special issue of Radical History Review that um, Rebecca actually was part of as an editor. And it actually presents a very broad diversity of sanctuaries and um, outside the confines, or confines of Christianity or church asylum. So I think that that's uh, definitely an issue to look at um, to, um, to see the diversity and of scholarship even on these different sanctuary spaces. Thank you. Uh, that um, was a, uh, uh, a really great way of, uh, of, of putting it. And, and uh, I, think, um, I think, you know, the, the idea of sanctuary scape is, uh, you know, it needs to be uh, brought into uh, far more, uh, uh, more, uh, um, it should, it should, other, other academics should widely quote you. So I, I, I appreciate your talk. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Oh, Jose, Dr. Rivera. Yes, one last question, if I could. Yeah, when you showed the photograph of uh, Tony Anaya when he was governor and he had proclama you know, proclamation of New Mexico as a sanctuary state, kind of uh, reminded me of Obama when he put together his executive order for the Dreamers, you know, the DACA policy. And so it, that's a form of sanctuary, right? They're protected these young people who came here, you know, early age, and they're still here, they're in college now or working or other things. And during this time, they're protected. But like you said, you know, a sanctuary, very fleeting sometimes, it can change. And there have been threats to end it, as we know, uh, you know, uh, so, but for right now, it's still a, a protection, right? So they're in a sanctuary, stage, I guess, by way of, of an executive order. Yeah. Would, well, um, we that often, the way you would see it? Well, we often make a distinction between sanctuary um, movements that are grassroots, that are against the state, right? Such as the sanctuary movement of the 1980s, which is working against um, federal immigration policy. And so these were, you know, movements that were not necessarily, you know, having to do with um, policy making. They were just helping immigrants along the way. But then that did enter policy worlds. And so DACA wasn't necessarily called a sanctuary um, policy. But if we think about the limbo that DACA um, recipients are living in, it is certainly an interval, right? They're in this meanwhile place. Um, that can go in either direction, depending on the political winds. And I think that that is certainly one of the um, problems, right, of sanctuary, but also one of the um, main features that we are identifying here of being temporary, precarious, um, on, you know, having to depend on states or different governments or tribal governments or um, even um, uh, church church folks to decide who gets protection and care and who does not. So, and with all of those policies from the state, you know, like DACA, uh, it's very defined who gets to have that protection and who doesn't, right? And uh, that's one of the features of sanctuary as well, I think. So you're definitely hitting on that pin of the coloniality of sanctuary as a interval between safety and violence. Thank you. Well, I, uh, if there's any, no other questions, I, um, I wanted to uh, ask my own question and then also kind of wrap up after your response. Uh, so I really enjoyed your, your talk, uh, Dr. Varial. I, I'm really looking forward to, to reading your book um, in, in terms of, um, the the information that you have been sharing today and i think it really kind of ties into sort of just my own uh, experiences and and hearing stories uh, from uh, indigenous communities and native communities how uh, this this notion of sanctuary scape uh, has been very much part of our our way of life for for such a long time and i don't think anybody 
really realizes that anymore, except that unless you talk to some of the elders and, and they talk about some of the stories, the, the creation narratives and oral, oral stories and stuff like that, that, they, that they'll talk about those things and they'll come up, but I don't think it necessarily hasn't been analyzed or discussed in the way that we think about it today. Um, and so I guess my question for you is, is really what do you, I mean, we've, I think some others have alluded to this in their question about sort of some of the contemporary situations today, but where do you think this is going in for the future in, in terms of you know, this notion of sanctuary scapes in, in terms of not only just uh, political institutions, but I think in general, just, just, just everyday way of being and living. Mm, that's a very great question. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I, I really don't know. Um, you know, the future is so uncertain and precarious. <laughs> and right now in a pandemic, you know, living in quarantine, you know, in the past year and being cut off from relations, I think we were all in an enclosure of sanctuary, you know, trying to seek protection and care. And I think that all of us, you know, that became very present for us of the precarity of, um, of that situation. So I think that as um, the situation of environmental decline and, is our, and, um, and climate change, uh, the situation, how that's going to uh, force migration, it's going to um, create different flows of people even within the, the United States, the concentrations of power and capital are going to shift and sanctuary, which is friendship writ large, right, is going to be ever more important. And hopefully we can build on the radical part of sanctuary and humanitarianism and um, indigenous concepts of relationality and care and hospitality um, and, uh, and not the shadow side, right, of using sanctuary to do very anti-sanctuary things. So I'm hoping that moving forward, I know that sanctuary is gonna become more relevant. It already has, it's already proliferating in all kinds of different directions and that's for a reason. Um, and so I see that as, as becoming even more viable that way. But as long as we keep it moving forward in that trajectory of bending towards justice <laughs> instead of the opposite direction. As far as Native uh, American indigenous sanctuaries are concerned, Sanctuary practices among indigenous people, among African-Americans in the past and present, and among people of the global South, non-Western folks are sorely undocumented. Okay, we don't, they're not documented. And so I think that this work is gaining momentum. There is a scholar in Canada uh, who is um, putting together a book called Unsettled Sanctuaries. And it's all about Native American sanctuaries in Canada and the United States and kind of um, gathering up scholars to um, start documenting these stories that you told, you know, that you were told in your community. And I think that um, it's very important that we see this broad diversity of sanctuary and also highlight um, Native American traditions and African traditions of sanctuary. And of course, there were there were Cimarrones or Maroons who created their own uh, communities, escaping from slavery. And some of these have, um, spaces have been documented, but others have not. So I think that there's a lot of work for us to do. And I'm hoping that the sanctuary or sanctuary escapes concept um, is just beginning a dialogue. And I just hope people pick up the baton and run with it. <laughs> <laughs> and start, um, you know, writing about um, sanctuary stories in their own communities. So I'm, I encourage everybody to, to do that. All right, thank you. Then. I'm looking forward to it. Um, okay, so I want to thank everyone for attending um, our presentation today. I, I wanted to kind of just wrap up and say that Dr. Villarreal was participating in the, our New Mexico Visiting Scholar Program. That's one of our initiatives in the Center for Regional Studies. Um, and so she was here during the summer doing her research um, for the book. And um, we're looking forward to the book coming out with the University of North Carolina Press um, very soon. And so I just wanna thank everyone 
uh, for taking the time today to hear her presentation and, and uh, participating in the question and period. So um, thank you uh, to everyone. I hope everyone has a good rest of the day uh, and a good weekend and be safe and uh, keep tuning in for future Center for Regional Studies uh, events and activities as we start to transition to a little bit more in person uh, for the fall semester. Um, and so, so thank you very much for, for being here. It was wonderful. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.